and another McCoy over here. And then just a hop, skip, and a jump away is Kentucky. Hey sightseers, sightseeing Sally here. I'm with Morty. And today we're checking out Golconda. Yes, we're back in southern Illinois and we stumbled upon this gem of a forgotten town known as Golconda. Located in southeastern Illinois, Golconda is a small Ohio River town with origins dating back to the late 1700s. For those of you who don't know, a good portion of Golconda can be found on the National Register of Historic Places as part of a historic district. Along with that, there are some great sights to see and some fun history to explore. Let's go check it out. We're starting here over at the corner of West Washington and South Franklin. And the beautiful brick building in front of which we were standing is known as the Steyer House. It was formerly the Watson Hotel. Built in 1885 by Captain Theodore Steyer, it is one of several prominent structures here in town. And the neat part is, it's still got the old hand pump in the front yard. Yes, it is really neat. And evidence of a time before indoor plumbing. How often do you see that? I also love that it has the wrought iron fence going around the yard, the huge front porch, and the gnarly old trees on the grounds. Can you imagine what it would cost to heat this home in today's dollars? No, if it was in Wisconsin, it would probably legitimately cost a thousand dollars a month to heat this place. That's why they gut these old houses and re-insulate them. But down here in southern Illinois, they don't get as quite as harsh winters as us, so maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Well, it's still going to be a lot of fuel costs. It's probably going to be six, seven hundred dollars a month. It's still a lot. It buys a it's, lot of insulation. Yes, it would. It'd be better, I guess, to insulate it and then maybe burn a lot of firewood. Then across the street, you have this house. This particular home caught Marty's eye as we were driving through town. What's interesting about this home, besides the fact that it was built around 1894, is that its original owner, Fred Rotman, was the first of three generations to perform undertaking here in Golconda. Starting out as a carpenter, Fred quickly moved into the business of making coffins and performing funerals, opening up a funeral parlor on Main Street. I'll leave it to Marty to zero in on the home of the town's undertaker. Now, I don't know if the picture shows, but this house is like a tower. It's narrow and really tall, which drew me to it. I always like smaller homes. I've built a few homes in every home I have built. It's been a thousand square foot. And I just love to see the floor plan in there. I mean, that's about 500 square foot of floor. I'd like to see how it's on the first floor and what's on the second floor, the layout of it. I just think it's neat. Did you know it was the original home of the town's undertaker? Okay, I wouldn't want to live in it now, but. <laughs> Why, do you think it might be haunted? Might be. Well, according to what I understand, his funeral parlor was separate and downtown in Main Street. But you never know. Could have dragged home some spirits. Could have. Next up, we're going to head on over to the courthouse and check out what's there. Originally named Sarahsville after one of its founders, Sarah Lusk, Golconda got its start as a ferry crossing on the Ohio River at the mouth of Lusk Creek. Considered a gateway to the west, this early ferry crossing grew so much it eventually became the county seat for Pope County. We're going to have to walk a bit to get to the courthouse. We've already parked over here because it's a nice shady spot. We don't want the dogs to overheat. If you look up over here on my left, 
you'll see a really interesting looking building. It's the T.J. Abbott building. It's that tall, slim, white building. What's interesting about that building is that it opened up as a bakery by T.J. Abbott and later was turned into the Paddle Wheel Saloon. Now it's home to Lacey's Locks, a hair salon here in Golconda. One thing about Golconda and the fact that a good portion of it is in the historic district is that there's so much to see here, we're not going to get to all of it. But that's okay, because if you were to come down to Golconda, you yourself could take your own little history tour, because throughout the town they have stops here where you can call in this special number and punch in the stop that you're at and find out the history of whatever building you're checking out. You'll learn a lot of neat interesting things about the town like for instance that these buildings all the way down here are what are called Mesker buildings. And if I remember right when we did Elizabethtown I showed one so don't forget to see that video. But anyways, these are all poured cast holding up all the brickwork above on the buildings here. These whole facades, it's all supporting all the brick above in the building. They're poured cast steel. I think we also saw some in Rosie Claire, which if you didn't know is actually not too far from here. Here, I'll put it up on the map so you can see just how close we are to Rosie Claire and Elizabeth. Buds McKenzie's missing. Poor guy. Hope somebody finds him. I know how distraught I would be if we lost one of our dogs. We'll keep an eye out for old Patch here. What do you think? Should we head over into the courthouse and check that out? For those who don't know, Golconda is the county seat for Pope County, which is why they have the county courthouse here. From what I understand, this is the third version of their courthouse. If I remember correctly, the first one that was built was built like a log cabin. And I don't recall dates or anything like that. I'm not sure if it burnt down or if they just decided to enlarge and build a grander style courthouse, but this is what's now here. I guess you could say the third time is a charm. As you can see, Marty's checking out one of his favorite things, Canon. I never really noticed it until now or after a few times of seeing cannons that they always flip them, the wick holes are on the bottom. It kind of looks like it's here, but it's not. There's just a casting wall, wick holes underneath. One thing that we haven't gotten into yet is the fact that Golconda, being built on the banks of the Ohio River, has been subjected to flooding over the years. Now Marty uh, was looking at some photos of the town back in the day. And from the several photos I was looking at, if I remember right, the water line was just below that stone sill on the window. So almost six feet up in town here, at least six feet up on this building. I believe that the photos that Marty was looking at were photos of the flood of 1937, which after that, the town decided to build a levee. And if you look down Main Street, you can see that it basically dead ends into the levee. After we're done here in the courthouse, we're going to head over down by the levee, down by the river. There's some interesting things to see over there and we'll get a little bit more into the flooding and some of that history. For now, though, we're gonna go on inside, finally. Since this is an active courthouse, we didn't tarry too long in there, nor did we decide to speak anything because we just don't want to be disruptive and we're being mindful of the fact that business is going on in there. Yeah, I don't need to end up in court again. 
When were you in court? <laughs> I haven't been. Well, at least that's since we've been together. Before we go any further, I have a couple of quick shout outs to give. First, a special thanks goes out to Randall for becoming our latest patron here on Patreon. And then I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to Matt and Abby from Wisconsin for tipping our trip jar. Thanks to your generosity, we're able to get out to these wonderful hidden gems across America. Now, back to exploring Golconda. Check this out. How many bills do you think were posted on here over the years? I've never seen a pole with that many nails and staples. This pole must have been where they were hanging all the wanted posters. Jesse James must have been around here. Actually, he was, wasn't he? He might have been. Cave in Rock, wasn't it? Um, well, who was that? Oh, the name escapes me. But there is somebody else, a name that you all will find familiar that I've failed to mention up until now. And that is the McCoy last name. There were McCoys living here. They're actually related to the famous McCoys who got into the feud with the Hatfields. Yes. One place in town that is a must-see is the Pope County Historical Museum. Started by a small group of citizens in the mid-1960s, this museum showcases the county's history and local artifacts. Considered one of the finest museums of its kind in all of Illinois, they even have one display here that's so rare you won't believe it until you see it. I think we might be able to go on inside. I think we have Let's go check it out. an in. But before we do that, I thought you were going to point something out about the building. Oh, this is another one. You look at the green along the bottom and then it turns it in brown. Them are all the Metzger's cast poles. It's holding up. You can see all the brickwork above. I mean, wood would rot and that would all collapse. But that's all cast steel holding all of that brickwork up on top. And they're everywhere in this town and all over in this area. Normally, the Historical Society Museum is closed during this time of the year. However, we were able to meet some of the people here in town yesterday when we came to scope things out, and they graciously allowed us to come in today. So we're going to take a walk around, check things out, and see what we can find out about the history of Golconda. If you want to find out what life was like back in the day for the residents of Pope County, you've come to the right place. Most of the artifacts that are displayed here were donated either by residents or their descendants and are evidence of life in its early days. Here we can see that in Golconda's early days there was a Ford dealership known as Babe Hum Motors. You can see there was also a Chevy dealership known as Anderson Chevolds. But that's not the only bit about Golconda you'll learn. At one time, this building used to be home to Watson's Hardware. You can still see the sign for the old hardware store along with pictures of what the store looked like back in the day. They even have a record of the pistols that were sold in the hardware store between the years of 1883 and 1931. Now back in this corner here, you're going to find some amazing sights. First off, you're going to find an actual woolly mammoth tusk. That was, believe it or not, excavated right here in Golconda. In January of 1926, while digging on the banks of the Ohio River in preparation for the construction of Dam 51, a steam shovel exposed a two-foot-long piece of the ivory tusk. Pretty amazing, huh? And when it was all said and done, enough pieces of the woolly mammoth were recovered that you could get an idea of how immense that animal is. Those pieces, by the way, are on display in the basement of the Illinois State Museum.
The other thing that caught my eye back here is this display. Some of you sightseers will find it quite interesting. It's a display showcasing artifacts from some of Pope County's lodges, including the Oddfellows and the Rebeccas. You've got this desk with the regalia from the Oddfellows, lodge cards, an old petitions English book, this old half round table from the Oddfellows Lodge, and then we've got a 1951 Royal Neighbors of America bylaws and a 1950s Rebecca Worthy matron gavel of one Sarah Heise Bradford, donated by Kenny Bradford Jr., among other things. Interestingly enough, the one lodge, the oldest lodge in town, is the one that they don't have anything on display for, the Golconda Masons. Started in 1853, this lodge is still active today. I could easily spend hours here going through everything. One thing I find really interesting is that you can see all the seniors that graduated from Pope County High School. Why don't we go take a look to see who graduated the same year that I did. Well, I don't recognize any of the names, but I certainly recognize the hairstyles. Well, Marty, what's been your favorite thing about exploring the old museum here? The mammoth elephant or mammoth tusk that they have here in the original. Really? I thought for sure it was going to be this pile of stuff here. I like that too a lot. I like the elephant tusk. Yeah, that was really cool. For those of you who enjoy thrifting, you can always stop at Golconda's thrift store called Not So New. If I'm not mistaken, this was the location of Fred Rotman's funeral parlor. You know, the man who built the house, the one that Marty really liked over on South Washington Street. You can see that the building has leaded glass and stained glass windows, making it the perfect place to hold a funeral back in the day. While Marty's inside looking for the deal of the day, we're going to move on. You can see at the corner of 103 Main, the building there with the old funeral sign. And then next door to that is a building that says Sweetwater Saloon. And then on the very corner is another brick building. It's the J.H. Benham building that was built in 1891 and started out as a drugstore. Later, it became home to the Masonic Lodge, with meetings being held on the second floor. If you look up there, you can see two light bulbs where their sign used to hang. Now the building's home to the Cupid's Nest and Fairy Hollow, a florist. Next up on the agenda, grabbing some lunch at Tanny's. Oh, I'm full now. I could almost go take a nap. Except there's so much more yet here to explore that we're gonna continue on I hear there's some interesting sights to see up over on Columbus Street. Back in the day, this section of Golconda was known as Silk Stocking Row, for this is where a lot of stately mansions were built on prime Riverside real estate. You can see that there are several large homes still standing along with the well-known mansion of Golconda. Formerly known as the Gilbert House, now known as the Riverview Mansion and Levy Lounge, this stately home was built back in 1894 and has been a hotel since the mid-1920s. At first I thought those buzzards up on the chimney or just fake part of the facade. But on closer look, they are real sightseers.
Moving on, there are a few more sights to see down at the end of Columbus Street. There's this home here, which was built in 1901, or roughly about 1901. And then you have the John Thomas Davidson cabin, which was built elsewhere and then moved here. And then on the end is the Alexander Hall Buell House. Looks like there might be a sign posted. Why don't we go over there and check it out? I'm sure our friends over at the Historical Society won't mind. According to the sign, Alexander Hall Buell received the deed to this lot in October of 1841 from Daniel Field. Prior to that, however, the Buell family had witnessed the Cherokees being moved along what is now known as the Trail of Tears. Apparently, they even helped some of the Cherokee by feeding them pumpkin. Interestingly enough, it is sometimes said that this house was a stop along the Trail of Tears. However, historically, we know that that's impossible as this house didn't exist at the time that event took place. I don't really know too much about this cabin other than it was moved here, but since this one also has a sign right on the door, why don't we go over there and see what it says, get the skinny, the story, solve the mystery of the cabin. Okay, so according to the sign, this cabin was built, it was located on a farm, not too far from a town whose name I have no idea how to pronounce. Azotus? Azotus? I don't know. All right, so it was built over there, and then in 1882, John Thomas Davidson bought it. And then in 1993, it was moved here. We're up now over by the river in the area where Dam 51 used to stand. My recollection of the dates might be a bit fuzzy, but I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, that the dam and lock system was put up, oh, I want to say 1940-ish, 1941 perhaps. It was in place until I think the 80s, like 1980 is when they took it down. The reason being they replaced it with a new dam farther down the river, about 12 miles from here or so. The houses that you see here are referred to as the Dam 51 houses or the Dam houses, as they were often referred to back in the day. According to one of the locals, it was the only time that you could use the word dam and not be committing a major offense by speaking. <laughs> and not be condemned for using foul language was when you were referring to the dam and any of its related components. Now, the houses, from what I understand, can be rented they are furnished with antiques and according to the reviews I read online and what I was told by some of the locals, they are really nice places to stay in, especially if you're looking for a getaway, a little R&R &R from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Though the dam itself is no longer in place, you can see that the old powerhouse still is standing. Along with this structure here, which I believe the locals refer to it as the castle. And then there is the measuring stick, if you will, where they kept track of or could see how high the water was. Apparently some people to this day still use it as a guide for how high the river is. Obviously we won't be going inside the powerhouse as that's been boarded up. But why don't we, since we're here, take a little look-see in the old castle and see what the view looks like from inside. It's a neat little structure, although it's been graffitied 
tagged up, but the view looking out is pretty spectacular. If I understood correctly, some people have used this as a wedding venue, and I can see why. You have a marvelous view. It's just, in its current state, needs a little uh, scrubbing action going on, a little elbow grease to spiff it right up, and it'd be the perfect place to have the wedding of your dreams. Well, Marty, what do you think? Should we move on? Let's go. One really cool feature here in Golconda is that they have this old staircase leading up the bluff or the hill overlooking the town that you can walk up. These stairs lead to a whole nother historic section of town where you'll see some mighty fine old mansions. Our last stop is the Golconda Cemetery. There's actually two cemeteries here. This one is the oldest of the two, established in 1822. The other one that's up on top of the bluff or the big hill, I think as the locals refer to it, that one was established, I wanna say about 50 years later, probably around 1872. Overlooking Lusk Creek, the cemetery is outside of the levee walls. Marty and I had come down here, I believe it was on Tuesday, to scope out the town, take a walk around, and we noticed as we were strolling through the cemetery here that a number of those who have been interred here were members of the Masons. Given what we found out at the Pope County Historical Society's museum, that's not surprising. We personally found it noteworthy though because our backgrounds don't necessarily lend to that. It's not something we're accustomed to. A while back we did a video on our hometown and when we were doing the research for that and growing up there, I don't even recall anything like that. We did have the Knights of Columbus, the Lions Club, Kiwanis, things like that, but I don't ever recall the Masons or the Freemasons or the Odd Fellows being a group within our community. Which is probably one of the reasons why we find it so fascinating. Anyways, you may recognize some of the names on the headstones here. This one is a McCoy. There are actually quite a few McCoys buried here. There are several Civil War veterans whose graves can be found here as well. And then there are the Steyers, whose home we started at. 